back in another lifetime of October of 2019, you did a story talking about your uh, meetup with Matt Lauer and how you were, you know, fairly impressed and thought that, uh, you know, his story needed to be told, but was there a place to tell it? And then it kind of went away. And then a few days ago, here in uh, 2020, in our new world and uh, the new uh, shadow of the pandemic, uh, Matt released his uh, his uh, expose on the Ronan Farrell eh, Farrow debacle that I'll call, or I'm sorry, his book, and uh, and what uh, transpired from there. Walk me through a little bit about the process of how you and Matt got together. <laughs> yeah, this is a fascinating element of a remarkable story because uh, obviously um you know I, I am not a celebrity journalist uh, i'm a senior columnist at mediaite uh and I'm, you guys at the blaze know who i am but uh you know i'm not well known nationally and uh you wouldn't think that i'm the person that matt lauer would seek out especially if you know that when matt lauer was the host of the today show he and I had done three rather high profile and news making interviews on different subjects over an extended period of time. And they were very contentious. We were not buddies. Uh, <laughs> I, I felt like he did, he did me no favors. Uh, I still give him crap about how he handled uh, all of those situations. But I think he, I think we had a mutual respect in that uh, I, I felt like he was the, the most uh and he was the most formidable interviewer I had ever gone up against. And I've done hundreds and hundreds of interviews. And I, I so I thought he, he was really good at doing an interview. And there were a couple of moments when we were in opposite foxholes against each other where I kind of felt like I, I got to know him as a, a person where uh, he showed me that that unlike most uh, people in the elite media, that he was not a, a complete jackass, uh, that he was fair, uh, that uh, he he at least uh, you know treated me decently when he could have treated me a lot worse. Well, he may, maybe uh, he actually he actually listened during the yeah, interview. Yeah, right. I mean, I, and by the way, that's an important important point, Jeffy. I think deep down he knew I was on the right side, even though he couldn't portray that on the air. And so he had a, he had a respect for my ability to discern the truth and my courage to stand up for things I believe in, even if they're not popular. And so when the Ronan Farrow book came out, I wrote a column saying, hold on a second, because uh, I'm, I'm well aware of how Ronan Farrow right. works. I'm, I'm very well aware of how this subject works. Boy, I have no a, kidding. Yeah, I have a very good BS detector. And there were parts of the story that made me go, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, th this doesn't forget about my experience. With Matt I know. This doesn't make any sense. And uh, and so I wrote uh, I was the only person to write anything remotely skeptical of Farrow's allegation that, you know, Matt Lauer had committed rape at the 2014 Sochi Olympics with an NBC producer. And I, I know this is going to sound crazy. And I know my wife thought it was crazy because she she woke up one morning and you know I was on the phone in our kitchen with Matt Lauer. Uh, and and I was not surprised when he called me. I, I was even though I had not spoken to him for years. I just had a feeling Matt was going to call me because right. I knew the nature of um, of this story. I knew he trusted me. I knew, or, or at least respected me. Uh, and I also knew that I had stayed in touch with one of his producers. Uh, and uh, so when uh, when he called me, and that, that's how he got in touch with me. That's how he got right. my contact information. So when he called me, I, I was not shocked, as, as strange as it was. We spoke for several hours over numerous days, very frank conversations. Uh, and it's very, I want to make this clear because this is not my first rodeo. I've been involved in high profile situations <laughs> like this before. And when I am get involved, uh, I am not like, oh, gee, wow, Matt, uh, that's awesome. Uh, your story seems so cool. Um, I, I, I am, this is not a pleasant uh, experience. Well, you have to be. I mean, right. you have to be. Right. But I want to make clear, this is not a, a pleasant experience uh, for anyone uh, when I do the interrogation. Uh, and it was not a, a pleasant experience for Matt Lauer at all. I, I mean, I, I flat out told Matt Lauer things. I, I guarantee it. No one other than maybe his wife uh, has, has said to him um, because I felt like he needed to hear it. Uh, and I think he respected that. And so uh, at a certain point, he said, why don't you come 
to my house in the Hamptons. I live in Los Angeles or outside Los Angeles. And uh, we, I'll tell you the whole story and I won't go on the record, but you know, you can report on it as, you know, essentially, I mean, to call it off the record, I don't know if this is the accurate term, but it was a, a highly right. unusual, highly unusual situation where I would write about what we talked about and my impressions of his story. And there were a couple of details I was able to give. Uh, interestingly, and I, and I found this in my uh, very long experience, almost no interview is worth doing unless it gets canceled at one point. Uh, and right. uh, and I think I think I think both of us canceled the trip before it actually happened. Wow. I think I I, th I don't remember if he canceled first or I canceled first, but we both canceled. Wow at one point and then finally decided, you know what, let's go ahead and do this. So I did this on my own dime, by the way. Uh, I took a red eye to the Hamptons, uh, paid for it all myself, drove out in a rental car uh, to the Hamptons. And we spent about six hours together and it was extraordinary. It was, and, and in retrospect, after what Matt released this week, what was really amazing is that uh, he would not even let me put Ronan Farrow's book on his kitchen table literally he would not he didn't want to see it he didn't want to, he had not read any of it he only knew the wow. basic allegation and right. and this is important for two reasons number one it's amazing that, that he transformed from a guy who didn't even want to see the book to a guy who literally went word by word right. line by line taking it apart with his own investigation so that was a 180 degree flip but from an investigative standpoint i thought that was fantastic because I was the person telling him what was in the book, and therefore I was getting face-to-face, real-time, instantaneous reaction, yeah. which is about as as good as you can get yeah. from an interviewer's standpoint. I mean, if, sure if I'm the person telling the subject, hey, this is what Ronan Farrow says, I can gauge his reaction far better than if he's prepared, if he knows what the, to to have what to say, what the holes in his story might be, if there are holes. So that was, from my standpoint, very credible. Um, yeah. And 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 so there was, it was very clear to me after those five or six hours that there was a completely different side to this story than the one that Ronan Farrow told. And uh, and quite frankly, I, my suspicions were that there was a that that side of the story was far more credible than Ronan Farrow's, but I didn't know this for sure yet. We needed to do some investigation. And so at that point, Matt, when I got back to, to the LA area, Matt and I started speaking on the phone almost on a daily basis. I mean, there was there were several weeks where where we, you know, things happened where we weren't on the phone. But I I mean, I, I, I'm not one to is prone to exaggeration of this kind of thing, but I, I would guess we've probably been on the phone a hundred hours in the last uh, wow. seven months, some, something like that. Um, you know, sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, and in, and, and basically long story short, what happened here was Matt started his own investigation. Yeah. Matt decided to, to do the reporting on his own situation uh, and on Ronan Farrow's allegations. And what he found was astonishing. There were numerous things he knew to be false because it was, he was the one that experienced it. Right. Not just not just a rape allegation, by the way, but just all the details surrounding it were off or totally wrong. And that's one of the keys to Ronan Farrow's M.O., Jeffy. Ronan Farrow creates the impression of a, an incredibly well-researched and investigated story by giving you minute details that that make the reader think, wow, this guy he really had to have done his research. Oh, he really got wow. He even right. he even knows about. Uh, I'll give you a stupid little uh, detail. Uh, the, the, a detail about the stationery that Matt Lauer uh, used that <laughs> it, that uh, Brooke Neville's saw in the hotel room in Sochi, and uh, and it turns out that was totally false. It it's just made up. It's I don't know. I, I, my guess is that Brooke Neville's. Once saw his stationery in his office and and gave that up as a detail. And Ronan decided, wow, that'll really show authenticity and and credibility. And we'll put that in Sochi. And it, and it was actually totally wrong. It's not even what the stationery says. He didn't bring the stationery with him to Sochi. I mean, just a tiny little detail like that. But it it's used by Faro to make it seem like wow, he has really done his research. And so, so, and then the key part of this, Jeffy, was that 
there were four people, there were actually more than this, but there were four people who were willing to go on the record with Matt Lauer who were used in Ronan Farrow's book as corroboration for Brooke Neville's story. Now, these were incredibly important details yeah. that, that, that related to her credibility, corroborating her story. And those four people were never contacted by Ronan Farrow. They That's one never of my favorite spoke- parts. That's yeah. one of my favorite parts of the Matt Lauer uh, article op-ed experience right. uh, is where, uh, you know, Matt lays it out that did, uh, you know, did Ronan ever show any real proof of that? No. Uh, no, he did not. How do I know? Because I did. It's right. just it's just incredible. Yeah, it's very it's he, he lays it out very well. But I want to make it clear to the audience what what happened here. So so there's these four people that are used for corroboration. Not only did Ronan Farrow and his fact checker never speak to them. Here's the really important part. That would be bad enough from a journalistic standpoint. Those four people tell entirely different stories than are in the book. And and let me be very clear, Jebby. What's in uh, in, uh, the critique of Ronan Farrow's reporting by Matt Lauer is the tip of the iceberg. You have to understand the context here because these are people who um, I believe all four of them are still working in media jobs. Matt Lauer is, is, you know, considered persona non grata. He can yeah. do nothing. He can do nothing for these people. This is a, as toxic a subject as it gets. So these people have absolutely no incentive. Now, there's I understand that there's a media outlet trying to discredit one of these stories by claiming a very remote conflict of interest. And I can assure you okay. that's bull crap. I know the details <laughs> on that. And I actually hope I actually hope. I hope this news outlet goes with the story because if they do and if they out one of these particular four people, um, I think the backlash uh, and what will happen next will actually be better than what was in Matt Lauer's story because I know the truth of the matter. Uh, so good luck with that, uh, 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 reporters out there. Um, but the, but here's what we now know for sure, that Ronan Farrow did not even check with these people. He simply accepted the word of Brooke Nevels. In fact, he embellished the word of Brooke Nevels, never checked it. And now that he's been confronted on it, and this is to me, you know, the the silence is deafening. He has no response. Ronan Farrow's only response is, I'm Ronan Farrow. He's Matt Lauer. Screw off. I mean, that's essentially what he has said. And even Billy, and even Billy Bush, Billy Bush of uh, Access Hollywood fame, yeah. who's now on Extra. And let's be clear who Billy Bush is. Billy Bush is a former Today Show employee. Right. And, I'm, and I'm probably one of like uh, 10 people in the world that know this, although I did tweet it, tweet it, so I guess my followers do. Uh, Billy Bush was in the same bar as Matt Lauer and Brooke Neville's The Night of the Episode. I mean, so so Billy Bush uh, is, is, is a borderline witness wow. to this situation. And That's Billy Bush took Ronan Farrow to the woodshed on Extra the other night, uh, saying that his response to Matt Lauer's expose was completely inaccurate. In, so, inaccurate. so uh, two things from from the experience that we're, we're at right now. Uh, one is it's been about what? maybe even 14, 15 years, boy, it doesn't feel that long, that we've got at a point now where the media, mainstream media, uh, decides what they want the outcome to be. And then so everything else before that has to fit the narrative to the outcome, not the other way around, right? Jeff, what you just said there, that's 100% accurate. 100%, 100%, what you just said there is maybe the most important thing people need to understand about the modern news media, right there. And number two is when did Ronan Farrow, and I know he's, uh, you know, royalty, uh, when did we nominate him to be all seeing, all knowing guru of the world? Because it is the case. I mean, it is the case. Besides this, and uh, even the Harvey Weinstein stuff is, you know, there's a lot of questionable stuff in that story. Story. Then we move on to, I mean, he and his, it was him because of him that they squashed, you know, I, I hate to do the, the mandatory uh, uh, disclaimer. I know 
these people are all dirt bags and they deserve to get all the dirt thrown on them that they can. But Harvey and Matt also are humans and didn't do everything that somebody claims they did. And the same with uh, his dad, right? I mean, they quashed his book and it was just because of him. I mean, he's the all saying, all new and guru. How, do, how, does, how does that go away? Well, that's, I think, the primary motivation for Matt Lauer to tell his story. It, and when one, he wants to correct the record about himself. But I do believe that he thinks that Ronan Farrow is a dangerous man who does not deserve this kind of power. Uh, that, uh, in fact, um, you know, he's now become the moral arbiter of all male female uh, sexual relationships in this country, <laughs> right. which is, which is, when you think about it, as bizarre as it gets, because uh, I mean, here's a guy who his own personal narrative should actually disqualify him <laughs> from being the moral arbiter because his entire family, his entire yes, family is, is, uh, is, is immersed in the subject of alleged sexual abuse. He believes that his sister was sexually abused by his father and that uh, this is why there's a massive rift between his mother and his father, Woody Allen and Mia Farrow, and, and that this destroyed the entire family. Now, how can you possibly be objective about this subject when it is it is part of the DNA of your entire family existence? And by the way, just to be clear, I don't believe Woody Allen is guilty. I, I think the evidence in, is pretty strong that he is not guilty. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't bet my life on it, but I don't believe that Woody Allen is guilty of this, which to me goes to this issue of the entire persona of Ronan yeah. Farrow based in him believing a false allegation right? and uh, that was facilitated by his mother during a, a very brutal divorce and custody battle. So... Um, and there, and, and, and let's also be clear, you're not allowed to say this, but I guess on this show, you probably are. Ronan Farrow Absolutely. happens to be gay. He happens to be gay. So, so he, that doesn't mean he's not allowed to speak about this, but he has never experienced a male female sexual relationship as right. far as we are aware, right. uh, and therefore has absolutely no expertise in, in the way that it might go down between, let's say, a celebrity and a female who's in the business. I mean, this is this is part of the reality of the real world that no one wants to accept here. Uh, and so, uh, and, so what, where do you think we're like? So Matt Lauer uh, lost the job and not because of the rape allegation. Right? He lost the job because he admitted to having an, an a affair or a affairs, plural. But NBC were at, during that time. I mean, anybody that admitted to, you know, touching the back of a female is worthy of being strung up in town square. So he gets fired and now the rape allegation comes. Well, it's been proven that Brooke was, you know, just happy, a little pee in a pod talking about her affair with, with Matt. Where did the rape allegation come in? What, what okay. benefit does that have? Okay. Well, what you just said is important for understanding the allegation against Matt Lauer. Cause I think understandably people have conflated the uh, uh, infidelity allegation with the rape allegation. So, so, so here's what really happens, okay? Let's go back to 2017. The Harvey Weinstein thing hits. Me Too is all the rage. It's uh, late okay. fall, uh, early winter of 2017. And uh, let's be clear, NBC is vulnerable because NBC is being attacked by Ronan Farrow as having spiked his Harvey Weinstein story. Now, I still believe right. that what, you know, what I, I still believe, and this is important context, I still believe that NBC was correct at the time in not running Ronan Farrow's Harvey Weinstein story because I don't believe it was properly vetted. I don't I don't believe they had enough based upon what the current situation was. Uh, and, and, you know, it, was it vindicated in retrospect? Maybe, but that's not how you do journalism. That's not that's not how it works or at least not how it's supposed to work. So 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 NBC is getting destroyed over this. Now, in my view, they need a scalp. They need to prove how uh, down with me too, they are. And so in the midst of this moral panic, Brooke Nevels comes forward to NBC. Now, let's be clear, context is really important here. She comes forward to NBC with a lawyer and speaks to two female 
NBC human resource people, all right? So this is not a situation where she's going in to uh, the, the office of Dan Draper and Mad Men, and, you know, in the 1950s right. or 60s. Uh, and this is, and one, of, and one of the things that really I find hilarious is that people seem to think that in the, in the, in the, in the last few years before uh, Me Too, that NBC was somehow this draconian place where men ruled the world and, <laughs> and that men could have sex with whoever they wanted. This is NBC. This is the most yeah. politically correct, female-dominated yeah. media outlet you could possibly imagine. I mean, I, I, I've, I've been in, th in there in Rockefeller Center. I've been on the show, you know, today's show three times. I, I know the culture there. Uh, and not, not to mention, you just all you have to do is watch it. So, right. uh, so, so... So the idea that somehow, you know, she wasn't free to tell her story uh, in its full is absurd. But it, what the, what's the story she tells? She tells them, I had an affair with Matt Lauer and we had sex in his office or in his dressing room. And uh, you need to know about this. And there's no talk of rape. There's no talk. Of, I mean, she acknowledges that it's a, a multi-month wow. uh, affair. Uh, there's no evidence at all that the word rape ever gets used or anything remotely uh, wow. involving a lack of consent. So uh, so Matt Lauer gets asked, Matt, did you have a sex with a, a fellow and NBC employee in your, your dressing room? And Matt says, yes. And in the midst of that moral panic, and I believe seeing... And I believe seeing an opportunity. I mean, let's be clear. Sure. They get a they get a Me Too scalp. They get rid of a massive contract. I mean, and and the television world was changing. Remember, yes, rate, it was. You know, ratings are going down. Fragmentation is taking a toll. And so the 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 era of the monster anchor with the huge contract uh, was essentially coming to to an end. I mean. I don't. It, people need to understand mm. the bigger picture. What, think about all the people that got decapitated at NBC in the last uh, several years. I mean, you've got uh, Brian Williams, Bob Costas, uh, Matt Lauer, Chris Matthews. Uh, I mean, these are all they're all white males uh, making right. big money, um, and and they all got to to let you know to one extent or the other. Brian Williams somehow is still surviving but not making anywhere near the money he used to and megan's so, in there too i know we're talking about just white males but megan's in that mix somewhere too right she was involved in all of that mix up at nbc megan, too right megan was Kelly? That, yeah that, that's a different story that's that what, i know but i'm, I'm just i was yeah I, I, i'm getting uh no, mixing no, up all that, that stuff. well no that's, that's fine but anyway just just to be so i'm just trying to create the context for the incentive structure for gotcha. nbc at this time yeah. and nbc has a, actually a perverse incentive to get rid of Matt Lauer at that moment. Um, and now Matt, and he gave he gave them the proof. He said, "Yeah, I did it." Well, but and and interestingly, Matt still doesn't buy into this. Matt, I, I, in my opinion, Matt is still a little naive about the situation uh, at at that time. Um, but you got to remember, I, I understand why that's the case. When you are a, uh, the king of morning television for twenty some years. Uh, and being treated the way that he is. I mean, my gosh. I mean, these people oh, are, are treated literally like royalty. And yeah. uh, and you think you think the people around you really love you. I mean, I, I, I mean, right. I, I mean, I, I guarantee the same thing happened to Bill O'Reilly at Fox News Channel. I mean, yeah. Bill, you know, I don't think Bill O'Reilly had any idea what was coming down the pike for him. Uh, because he, it's almost like you're an animal in a zoo uh, where you lose your survival instincts. You start yeah. to think everyone around you loves you when, in fact, they, they'll, they'll knife you in the back in a moment if it's in their in their best interest to do so. And that so, was proven. Right. And so so Lauer gets fired and, um, you know, his marriage falls apart. He's got obviously understandable uh, family problems. And he goes essentially goes away. He issues one very short statement. And he goes away, and um, and and I think he was okay with going away. I mean, he wasn't happy about it, but I mean, I think he he accepted it. And then all of a sudden, Ronan Farrow calls him up and says, uh, "Hey, I've got some reporting on you that I I want to you know uh, check with you on." And they meet before the publish publishing of this book. And you know that was that meeting uh, uh, based upon my conversations with Matt and another person that was in that meeting who was a friend of Matt's, who happens to be a lawyer. Uh, was rather extraordinary because Matt is stop, shocked to find that Brooke Neville's uh, allegation has gone from consensual sex in his dressing room 
to now an act of rape at the Sochi Olympics in 2014. And, and he's, and essentially he's like, well, how does this, how did this happen? What, 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 what are you talking about? Uh, and now we're, let's be clear, this is 2019 now. We're five yeah. years after the Sochi Olympics. And Ronan Farrow tells Matt Lauer and his friend, and this is almost a verbatim quote, that Brooke Neville's view that their sex had been an act of violence against her came to her, quote unquote, in hindsight. <laughs> in hindsight, not a year hindsight, not hindsight on the day she went to NBC, uh, although, you know, she's now trying to claim a different story on, on or at least her lawyers right. are on that. No evidence that that's, that's true. Um, uh, but this is five years hindsight. And most importantly, Jeffy, here's the most important hindsight part of it. After, after she is attempting to write her own book and after she has spoken to Ronan Farrow, and I believe it is my personal opinion that the book combined with the conversation with Ronan Farrow creates a mutual self-interest where they both convince each other that this was an act of rape. And that because, right. uh, because it works for both of them. And, it, and by the way, it fits in Ronan Farrow's, not just his reporting MO, but it fits in his view of male-female relationships. This is a guy who truly seems to True. believe, he truly seems to believe that if you have a powerful, famous male yes. who has sex with a someone in the business, by the way, incredibly important to point out, Brooke Neville's never worked for Matt Lauer, never even worked for the Today Show, uh, certainly not at least uh, not at this time period. She was not even working for NBC News at this time. She's working for this Peacock Productions. So they were working for the same overall company. Right. There, yeah, they were under was, the same umbrella. I got but, it. There, but there was there was no direct uh, you know, he, Matt Lauer did not control Brooke Neville's career, right? And uh, and so I think that's important. But in Ronan yeah. Farrow's view, he views any powerful male who has sex with a far less powerful female is inherently, in his view, inherently at least somewhat rapey. I mean, yeah. and, 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 and that's not an exaggeration. Because, uh, he, well, in he his really view, believes that. Yeah, in his view, and many others, sadly, with this uh, this this power broker mentality, um, he ha held power over me. Um, they, you can't say no, right? There's no way for you to say no. I got news for you, uh, Ronan. Uh, you know, I, I don't know about your wife, John, uh, but uh, my wife is able to say no to whoever the hell she wants and when she wants. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing thing. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. You can say no. It's just, well, it's just incredible. Uh, no, exactly. Um, and I, I, I strongly disagree with that entire premise of the way Ronan Farrow looks at this. I'm not saying, by the way, that there aren't situations in which uh, someone does have direct power over a woman, although I, I think those days are probably pretty far gone because at this point, uh, you know, I, I don't know who who could possibly get away with that. Uh, in this environment, but I, I understand. I'm not naive. I, I get that there are situations where that can be uh, some sort of a sexual harassment situation. And I am firmly. And by the way, I don't even have a major problem with NBC firing Matt Lauer. I, that's not the issue. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I have a major issue though when you turn that allegation into rape, and uh, because you because you have a book to sell, and because your Harvey Weinstein story is old news, and because by the way you have a massive vendetta against NBC because you believe in this bizarre conspiracy right. theory. And that's what that's what Ronan Farrow is. He's a conspiracy theorist. He's actually worse than a conspiracy theorist, Jeffy. He's a narcissistic conspiracy theorist. He thinks the whole world is against him. He really does. And and he he believes that NBC was out to get Ronan Farrow, and now he's now you know paybacks uh, are a bitch. He's going back after NBC and using Matt Lauer as a weapon. And you know and I want to make sure people remember after this book came out, Ronan Farrow went on MSNBC with with uh, Rachel Maddow and dramatically announced, or I guess Rachel Maddow announced that NBC had agreed to let anybody, any woman out of a non-disclosure agreement that felt like they were being restricted to talk about their Incredible. sex abuse, whether it was by Matt Lauer or anybody else. 
And at the time, I said, okay, you know what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen. how wrong were you, John? How wrong were you? Hundreds. Hundreds. They came out of the woodwork. Right. It's the, 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 crick, the crickets are still chirping. Uh, uh, zero. Was there ever any? Was there ever any at all? I'm, I'm not aware of anybody that has come out against anybody, but certainly not against Matt Lauer, because because we would know about it. Uh, and it did not yeah. happen. I mean, and, and we're obviously far enough away from the from the event that this was going to happen. People uh, not even, you know, allies of Ronan Farrow uh, predicted that it was going to, you know, there'd be this this uh, outpouring. These floodgates would open and all these women would come yeah. forward and, and therefore the case would be proven. That has not happened. And it didn't happen because there was nothing there. And it was all because of a conspiracy theory that was put forward by Ronan Farrell because he has an agenda against NBC and to create these conspiracy theories that are not based in facts or logic and are frankly nonsensical. John Ziegler is the man we're talking to uh, at Zygmunt Freud on Twitter. You can follow him there. Uh, Where do we go from here? And uh, and they have the words of the the song 100 years ago, where do we go from here? I believe Alan Parsons project uh where do we go well you know great question um there's been very not as much follow-up on this as there should have been in the media because the media doesn't know what to do with this i mean the uh, they would love to have found something journalistically wrong with what uh matt lauer reported and as i've already alluded to i, I think there's going to be I, I believe there might be an effort to try to do that although i think it's going to be remarkably weak and, and it could very well backfire uh there's been some more reporting about uh, ronan farrow that i found to be fascinating the washington post a couple of days came out uh, with a story that yeah. guess what some of the things he said about harvey weinstein uh, we're, we're not accurate. And, and look, um, and look, John, I, I know, I know, you, you know, you did, and I know, you know, I know I did for sure. There's so much, uh, so much in these stories that just you read it and you go, that, that, that can't be true. It just can't be. And, and, and you find out that's why you don't, why it can't be because it isn't. Well, I have found that to be the case in a lot of uh, different stories, especially involving uh, this subject matter, Jeffy, as you know, um, where, uh, you know, if it, if it seems like it can't be true and there's no evidence to support it, then there's a good chance it's not true. <laughs> Doesn't I mean, right. strange things, strange things happen all the time, right? Things that seem ludicrous do, in fact, occur. But guess what? They have evidence to support them. I mean, yeah. the, the ultimate example I always use is, uh, you know, it's bizarre and nonsensical that O.J. Simpson would kill two people, including his, his ex-wife, and, and leave the, the bodies for his young children to find the next morning. That's insane. But guess what? There's a mountain of evidence that that occurred. Right. right? right. And, and similarly, if, if some of the things that, that uh, Ronan Farrow ha- has reported were true, uh, there would be a lot more evidence to support them. Yes, there would. And, uh, and, and so what I have found is, you know what, uh, I've actually been wrong more often in my career by not following my gut instinct than I have been yeah. by following it. I mean, in fact, I, mean, in fact, I would say the, the times when I was most wrong, uh, which haven't been that often, uh, is when I did not trust my own instincts enough. Because uh, common sense still really does almost always rule the day. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, you know, rationality still matters. Uh, and, and, you know, in most cases, if something doesn't seem like it makes sense, it's because it didn't really happen that way. How many times, how many times do you, have you said, uh, I knew it, I knew it. And, you, and it's just sort of gone forward. No question. So John, we've got, uh, you got the Penn state story under your belt. Huge story. You got uh, this Matt Lauer story under your belt. Huge story. Uh, what's next? What are we working on? Well, uh, you mentioned who Penn. are you? Who, what living room or kitchen are you sitting in right now, other than <laughs> yours? <laughs> well, actually, I'm at my my in laws' beach house uh, right now. Uh, well, we're, Sorry, well, but um, but uh, I'm you know, I, you know, look, I'm sure I'll probably get involved in something like this again. But just you mentioned Penn State, and I know you're very interested in that, and you've been well, supportive of my work on that. Um, you know, w- that story hasn't ended yet. Um, wow. Uh, and if, if it hadn't been for the coronavirus, uh, I think I think there there. In fact, I know there are people here in the Los Angeles area who are more confident than I am 
that uh, a major uh, push to tell that story in wow. its totality uh, would have come to fruition by now. Now, uh, right. whether that will still happen uh, post-virus, I don't know. I will say, and I've never talked about this publicly, but I might as well do so now, that uh, during the lockdown, uh, we have been in, in, in a deep dive production of a documentary podcast uh, on the entire Penn State, Joe Paterno, Jerry Sandusky story. That's not mm-hmm. like a normal podcast, not just, you know, hey, we're going to talk about something for with uh, for an hour, no edits. I'm talking about, uh, you know, hours and, and hours and hours and hours of episodes with with documentation and audio interviews and, and heavily edited uh, to make it as compelling as possible. I've got a co-host who is a, a, a very credible person here in Los Angeles. Uh, we have someone in the podcasting industry who is uh, funding and producing it. Uh, when, when and how and if that'll ever see the light of day, I don't know. But just so you know, I didn't. I haven't given up on that uh, because that, to me, that whole story, it, it, there has never been a, a story of that magnitude that is more different from the truth. Uh, than than the Penn State Joe Paterno Jerry Sandusky story. Never, ne- there's never been one, never been one. And um and Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book last year in yeah. which, he, in which oh, he did an entire chapter on that where he cited my work. Uh, and and you know he didn't he didn't he didn't come out and fully tell his uh, opinion as I believe it to be, but he essentially said uh, that Ziegler's r- at least ninety percent right, if not hundred percent right. Uh, and that people ought to listen to him. Uh, and uh, so we'll see. I mean, I, I'm I'm a pessimist right. on this subject, especially and and the way the media works in general. But I, I do know that um, if this if this podcast ever uh, sees the light of day in, in, in the proper venue, it's going to blow people's minds because the whole the right. real story the real story there is the most unbelievable uh, story uh, that I have ever been in contact with. And I've seen a lot of doozies uh, and it's not even close. It's not even close. Uh, and, and it's a very important story because I think it's happening in a lesser degree in, in many other ways, but this one had so many wow. elements of the perfect storm that, um, that made it so much larger than any other. And we still have uh, four people Three Penn State administrators and and Jerry Sandusky is currently in prison and is going to die in prison. Who whose uh, in, you know lives and reputations are still on the line here, and there's still court. You know, Jerry Sandusky still appealing. Uh, the former Penn wow. State president Graham Spanier had his conviction thrown out by a federal court, uh, and and the Penn, Penn the, the state of Pennsylvania is still fighting to to reinstitute it, which is ridiculous. I mean, so there's still a lot of things going on in that story, but it's it is. The most remarkable tale, and and, no and 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 part of what makes this podcast fascinating, Jeffy, is that it's not just a a, a a narrative of the evidence of the case; it's also the narrative of the hell that has been my last eight years of my life uh, going through this. Because this is <laughs> this has been hell. I mean, I was a young man before this thing started, and and now I'm an old man, and it's and it's not just because eight years has passed have passed. It's because of what this story has done to me because of all the in- injustice and insanity that I have faced both publicly and privately. Well, I could well understand how you're suffering at your in-laws beach house, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hey John, I, 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 I actually, I want to talk to you some more, but I'll let you go. I know you want to get back to the beach and, uh, you know, we've all got other things to do. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today, John. And, uh, but, Take care of yourself. And when something else happens with this, definitely want to spend some time. Anytime, Jeffy. Good to talk to you always.